okay now so let's talk about the causes of facial nerve paralysis okay now uh, facial nerve paralysis can be upper motor neuron lesion or lower motor neuron lesion okay so upper motor neuron lesion consists mainly of the central injuries like the uh, brain abscess, pontine gliomas, poliomyelitis, multiple sclerosis, okay, and intracranial part like the caustic neuroma, meningiomas, congenital cholestatomas, metastatic carcinomas, okay, and meningitis, okay. But we will focus more on the lower motor neuron, okay. So there is the intertemporal part, okay. So it under intertemporal part, we have the idiopathic causes, okay, infectious causes, and the trauma. Okay, we won't be dealing with neuroplasms, okay, uh, because uh, we will uh, we will discuss about the globus tumor, uh, facial nerve uh, facial nerve neuromas, and the acoustic neuromas in a different video. Okay, so we will discuss mainly about the idiopathic idiopathic causes, the infectious causes, and the uh, trauma traumatic causes. Okay. So, the most common idiopathic uh, cause for facial nerve palsy is Bell's palsy. Okay, now I've not included an image here because uh, we all know how a patient of Bell's palsy presents with. So, before we talk about the clinical uh, clinical present clinical presentations, let's talk about some features that we need to know. Okay, so it is the most common idiopathic facial nerve palsy okay most common idiopathic facial nerve palsy and it is often associated with the infection of uh, herpes simplex virus 1 okay and the site of bony lesion or the bell's palsy lesion is the uh, labyrinthine segment okay since it is a narrowest part of the facial nerve okay both the sexes are affected equally and there is a positive family history in 10% of the cases okay now how does the patient of Bell's palsy presents with there is dry eyes okay now we say dry eye because uh, it is involving the greater, uh, greater superficial petrosal nerve but uh, in some cases we can also see there is uh, drooping of the eye and there is tear coming from the eye okay it is not that there is hyper uh, secretion of the lacrim uh, lacrimal gland it's just that there is some secretion of the lacrimal gland but the since the facial nerve paral uh, facial nerve under paralysis, okay, they can't hold uh, the tear and there is tearing. Okay, there can also be hyperacusis due to loss of separated reflex. Okay, loss of taste in the anterior two third of the tongue. Okay, loss of salivation. Okay, all due to the um, injuries to the branch of the facial nerve. And there is motor palsy of the half of the face. Okay. That is the lower motor neuron palsy. Okay, the patient is unable to close the eye, and when he tries to do so, we see the Bell's phenomenon. It is the uh, what do you mean by Bell's uh, Bell's phenomenon? It is the when the person tries to uh, close his eyes, the eyeballs turn up and out. Okay, up and up. And so when the person tries to close the eye, the eyeballs go up and out. Okay up and out it is the nose here so goes up and out so this is known as Bell's phenomenon okay so uh, how do we manage a patient of Bell's palsy now if the patient presents to you acutely that is within uh, three days of the uh, onset of symptoms then we give acyclovir okay to the patient because there is association with herpes simplex, herpes simplex virus okay along with steroids okay so if depression uh, presents to you acutely, we give um, within three days we give acyclovir. But if he presents to you later, okay, after three days we don't give acyclovir. Okay, we don't give antivirals. We only give steroids. Okay. So what is a preferred steroid? We give prednisolone. Okay, one mg per kg per day divided in morning and evening doses for five days. Okay, then slowly we can taper the dose. Okay. We also go for physiotherapy with facial exercises, okay, and nerve stimulation, okay. Now, there is no uh, there is no proper evidence that facial exercise helps in Bell's palsy, but uh, it gives a psychological boost to the patient, which is helpful, okay. And we have to protect the eye, okay. We must protect the eye against exposure keratitis. If we don't uh, protect the eye 
and we leave the eye as it is okay now since there is facial paralysis the person would uh, the patient would not be able to close his eyes so it there is risk of exposure keratitis okay so how do we protect the eye first of all we have to give lubricants okay since there is dry eye we have to give lubricants okay and we close the eye with uh, eye pads okay or we can also go for temporary tassografi now temporary tassografi means we uh, stitch the lateral borders of the eye okay so if the lateral borders of the eye are stitched okay the eye automatically decreases in the size and even though the patient is not able to close the eye there is lesser chances of exposure keratitis okay now um, once treated the uh, bell's palsy has a recurrence rate of 10% okay so we can't say there is no there is not recurrent uh, cases in bell's palsy although there is it is very uncommon okay so there is recurrence but it's very uncommon okay now the second idiopathic condition that we will discuss is the uh, melkerson rosenthal syndrome okay it is also idiopathic okay and is um, characterized by a triad of recurrent facial palsy okay there is recurrent pa uh, facial palsy a uh, history of recurrent facial palsy there is swelling of lips okay as you can see you have swelling of lips you have swelling of lips okay and there is fissuring of tongue okay so if this is the, your normal tongue there is fissures lots of fissures okay so a triad of recurrent facial palsy swelling of lips and fissuring of tongue suggests merkelson rosenthal syndrome okay it is an idiopathic condition and the treatment is same as that of facial palsy now what are the infections that cause facial palsy facial nerve palsy okay so it can be viral or bacteria okay now bacteria we have discussed um, the asom and uh, unsafe csom okay we will discuss malignant otitis externa in a separate video okay uh, with uh, diseases of external uh, external ear okay so in asom the most common part okay most common part of facial nerve involved is the horizontal part horizontal or the tympanic part of the facial nerve okay and it is due to dehiscence of the facial nerve facial nerve canal sorry dehiscence of facial nerve facial nerve canal okay so let's talk about the viral one so in viral we have the ramsey hunt syndrome Okay, it is also known as herpes zoster uticus. It is due to the herpes zoster virus. Okay, so here you see in the uh, image here, facial paralysis will be along the vesicular rashes. Okay, in the external auditory canal, you can see the vesicular rashes here. Okay, here. Okay, the facial paralysis will be along the vesicular rashes in external auditory canal and the pinna. Okay, there will be anesthesia of the face. giddiness and hearing impairment due to involvement of fifth and the eighth nerve okay so due to involvement of the fifth and eighth nerve there will be anesthesia of the face okay there will be giddiness and there will be hearing impairment okay so this is about rosenthal sorry this is about the ramsey hunt syndrome and the treatment is uh, similar to that of bell's palsy now let's talk about uh traumas that cause facial nerve palsy okay now trauma can be of two types okay it can be surgical that is iatrogenic okay and it is most commonly seen in parotid surgery now why is most common in parotid surgery than the uh, mastoid surgery because at the level of parotid okay the facial nerve is not protected in a facial nerve canal okay so it is more uh, more common in parotid surgery so okay, if it is a parotid okay the facial nerve is in a way naked because up till the styloid mastoid foramen it was uh, traversing through the fallopian canal but since it has leave the uh, styloid mastoid foramen it is now naked and it can be injured easily okay so there is more chances of injury in parotid surgery then there can be fracture of temporal bone okay now fracture of temporal bone can be of two type it can either be longitudinal or it can be transverse or vertical okay the longitudinal fracture means that the fracture line runs 
parallel to the temporal bone okay runs parallel to the petrous part of temporal bone okay and the transverse fracture okay runs parallel no sorry perpendicular to the uh, petrous part of temporal bone then okay across the so fracture line run across the petrous okay so now let's discuss about the fractures in a bit today so longitudinal fracture is more common okay and the structure injured are tegment the ossicles and the tympanic membrane okay now since these structures are involved okay so you can say since there is ossicle involvement and there is tympanic membrane involvement the hearing loss will be a conductive type of hearing loss okay they won't there will be no vertigo or if there is there is it is very uncommon because we are not in uh, we are not getting involved in the middle middle ear structures okay so in longitudinal fractures there is no damage to the middle ear uh, sorry inner ear so there is no vertigo okay but there is a uh, csf otoria that is the uh, csf coming from the ear external auditory canal okay so you can see there is water or csf coming from the uh, here it is due to uh, the tz um the it is due to the defect in the tympanic membrane and the tegment okay there are also bleeding from the ear okay so bleeding from the ear is common in the longitudinal type of uh, temporal fracture but the facial nerve palsy is not so common okay it is more common in the transverse fracture okay so transverse fracture the facial nerve palsy is more common okay now in transverse fracture the structure injured are the labyrinth okay the inner ear and the nerve so there will be a sensory neural type of hearing loss there will be severe vertigo and there will be cs uh, csf otorhinorrhea that is the csf is coming from nose okay now why is coming from nose because if it there is a fracture of the labyrinth and there is fracture from of the tegment and the uh, floor as well it will go to the ear and then out of the ear as seen in longitudinal fractures but since there is no injury to the tegment okay all this uh, csf goes from the eustachian tube into the nose and then we see csf otorhinorrhea okay as and as i have told earlier facial nerve palsy is much more common in transverse fracture okay so what is the base best investigation for uh, trauma causing the uh, facial nerve palsy it is hrct okay wherever you want to see minute structures you go for high resolution ct so how do we manage complications okay uh, the complications uh, which are post surgery okay so you have done a surgery on the patient and uh, after surgery you look at the patient to check whether there is any relief symptoms or uh, relief symptoms so if there is no uh, relief symptoms okay if there is sudden onset of palsy so you have just uh, done the surgery and after surgery when you look at the patient there is still facial nerve palsy then we go for immediate re, uh, re exploration okay we try to see what is the problem okay and if there is need for any graft okay we can put in the graft also so what is the most commonly used graft the most commonly used graft is the greater auricular nerve graft okay so other grafts or longer grafts that we can also use are the sural nerve graft or the lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh okay but in late onset palsy such as um, if you have operated on the patient and after operation the patient looks healthy okay there is no sign of palsy but after one day the patient comes back to you and you see that uh, there is palsy okay now earlier there wasn't uh, earlier there was no palsy after surgery but after one day there is palsy now so it is a late onset palsy and is often due to edema okay edema which compresses the facial nerve and there is facial nerve palsy so we go for steroids there is no need for uh, re exploration or surgery okay so we can give steroids so now let's talk about the complications following nerve regeneration okay so when a nerve gets cut okay it regenerates yes nerve do regenerate and when there is aberrant reconnection okay when they con uh, when they connect with other nerves it may lead to complications so what are the complications that we commonly see 
So first one is synkinesis. Synkinesis means mass movement. So here, when a patient wishes to close the eye, the corner of the mouth also twitches or vice versa. Okay. So there is mass movement when the patient tries to close the eye. Okay. There can also be crocodile tear. Okay. There is gustatory lacrimation. So there is a unilateral lacrimation when the patient chews or masticate. Okay. Unilateral lacrimation with mastication. So why does it happen? Here there is a faulty regeneration. Okay. Faulty regeneration. Okay. Aberrant regeneration of the parasympathetic fibers which now supply lacrimal gland instead of the face, uh, salivary gland. Okay. So the nerves should have supplied this salivary gland. Okay. But there was an aberrant regeneration and is now supplying the lacrimal gland. Okay. So now every time the person chews, okay, every person, every time the person must, uh, uh, chews, mastication is there, there will be lacrimation also. So it is known as crocodile steer. Okay, gustatory lacrimation. So what is the management? We can give botulinum, botulinum toxin in the lacrimal gland. Okay, so lacrimal gland won't produce uh, tears and the person will have symptomatic relief. There can also be ticks and spasm. Okay, there can also be contractures as well. Okay, now there is a syndrome that is known as Frey syndrome of uh, facial nerve degeneration complication, but it's not. Okay, so what is Frey syndrome? Frey syndromes mean the state is sweating okay so here the patient uh, there is uh, here in this here in this patient there is sweating and flushing over okay flushing over uh, over the parotid skin okay so whenever the person chews whenever he under uh, whenever he takes um, something to eat okay there will be sweating and flushing of the skin over the parotid gland okay so why does it happen okay so here there is aberrant regeneration of the auriculotemporal nerve okay so when there is injury to the auricular nerve, uh, temporal nerve in any uh, any trauma and it is most commonly due to parotid nerve uh, parotid surgery okay parotid surgery there is injury to the temp uh, auricular temporal nerve okay after the injury there will be regeneration but here there is an aberrant re-innervation or regeneration of the parasympathetic fibers of auricular temporal nerve with the sympathetic sweat glands okay overlying the parotid gland so whenever the person chews there will be sweating and flushing over the skin of the parotid gland okay so it leads to embarrassment okay or social embarrassment so we have to treat it now how do we treat it we can give botox as we did in the crocodile tears okay or we can also go for implantation okay we can implant the uh, we can go for stenocleidomastoid graft or silicone graft okay which we place below the skin overlying the and uh, overlying the parotid gland so if this is the parotid gland and this is the graft okay now this is skin okay so if this is graft here okay there won't be any uh, sympathetic sweat glands that are activated okay so it will not lead to sweating and the person is relieved also the botox the botulinum toxin also works in the similar fashion okay it destroys the sweat glands okay so whenever he chews there will not be any sweating so that's all about facial nerve anesthesia disorders